you have my prayers, well, I expect your kind answers, Father John Peake. Okay. Interesting point. What uh, I did is I wrote Father Peake back, and I says I welcome this opportunity because this is obviously something that concerns people. How do we explain the idea of perpetual successors, etc., in the present situation of the church today? Well, first of all, the concept of a long interregnum is not incompatible with perpetual successors. In this institutions of uh, fundamental theology, Dorsch teaches, the church, therefore, is a society that is essentially monarchical. But this does not prevent the church for a short time after the death of a pope or even for many years from remaining deprived of her head. And this, we give it right in the Latin here, too. Her monarchical form always remains intact in the state. Thus, the church is indeed, then indeed, a headless body. Her monarchical form of government remains, though then in a different way. That is, it remains incomplete and to be completed. The ordering of the whole to submission to her primate is present, even though actual submission is not. For this reason, the See of Rome is rightly said to remain after the person sitting in it has died. For the See of Rome consists essentially in the rights of the primate. These rights are an essential and necessary element of the church. With them, moreover, the primacy then continues, at least morally. The perennial physical presence of the person of head, however, is not so strictly necessary. But what he's saying up here is, but this does not prevent the church for a short time after the death of a pope or even for many years from remaining deprived of her head. It's not against the concept of perpetual successors. In fact, the longest type of interregnum prior uh, to what we experience today was Pope Clement IV. He died on November 28, 1268. Nearly three years later, Blessed Gregory X was elected. Now the point I'd like to make is, is this. I'd ask Father Peak. I'd ask, ask anybody, where does the Catholic Church teach? Well, it can be a three-year interregnum, three years of no pope, but it can't be 48 or it can't be 20 or it can't be 10 or it can't be 5 or it can't be whatever. The church nowhere teaches that. I mean, it's obviously a very unusual situation. It's very disturbing because it's unprecedented. But the concept that, well, you can't have this because there has to be perpetual successors, you know, is this... this this priest is saying here, this does not prevent the church from remaining deprived even for many years. This Father Edward O'Reilly, S.J., the, the Relations of the Church to Society. And this was gotten off of John Lane's website. Um, if any of you um, know of his website, he has a lot of good references here. This Father O'Reilly was a, uh, was a uh, master theologian. He was theologian to many different bishops in Ireland, and uh, he was named to the the Irish College in Rome. Even though I don't believe he accepted it or he didn't fulfill that, but he was named to be like the rector in charge of that. And he speaks about this point. He's talking about the Western schism again. We may stop. We may here stop to inquire what is to be said of the position at the time of the three claimants and their rights with regard to the papacy. In the first place, there was all throughout, from the death of Gregory XI in 1378, a pope. With the exception, of course, of the intervals between the deaths and elections to fill up the vacancies thereby created. There was, I say, at every given time, a pope really invested with the dignity of the vicar of Christ, the head of the church, whatever opinions might exist among many as to his genuineness. Not that an interregnum covering the whole period would have been impossible or inconsistent with the promises of Christ, for this is by no means manifest. So Father O'Reilly, he's saying in his mind, the true Pope is the one in Rome. And just to recap this for those who are not familiar with this, many of the popes were coming from French descent. The Pope was living in Avignon, St. Catherine of Siena, told the Pope, please come back to Rome. It's dividing the church. The Pope comes back to Rome. He dies. The cardinals get together, many of them French cardinals, and they elect 
an Italian. And Urban, Pope Urban then turns around and he starts to chastise the cardinals. And the cardinals then say, well, we were under duress. And so the majority of the cardinals flee to Avignon and elect their own man. I believe it was a Pope Clement. So now you have Christendom divided. There's a Pope in Rome, and he was the true Pope because he was recognized as such. No one contested the election. But then you have the men who elected him saying, we were under duress. This was not a valid election. And they're claiming now, the majority of them up in Avignon, that their second choice is now the true Pope. This went on and on and on and on. And then after about 20-something years, people from Rome and people from Avignon said, this is enough. We have to remedy the situation. So they went to Pisa and elected a third man pope. So he had three claimants to the, the papacy. And once again, very confusing time. Nevertheless, Father Edmund O'Reilly is saying, now if you notice the date, 1882, this is well after Vatican Council I, he's saying not that an interregnum covering the whole period would be impossible or inconsistent with the promises of Christ. This is by no means manifest. Now, what about Father Peake's other point with regard to, well, you know, you don't got any, if you don't have any, uh, if you don't have any cardinals, then you got a problem. Because without cardinals, you know, you can't elect, you can't elect somebody. And I'd like to just show you this real brief quote. This is a little bit bigger type. Now maybe we can read this. The Church of the Incarnate Word by Monsignor Charles Jornet, 1954. During a vacancy of the Apostolic See, neither the Church nor the Council can contravene the provisions already laid down to determine the valid mode of election. And he's quoting from Cardinal Cajetan, OP. However, in case of permission, for example, if the Pope has provided nothing against it, Or in the case of ambiguity, for example, if it is unknown who the true cardinals are or who the true pope is, as was the case in the time of the the Great Schism, the power of applying the papacy, papacy to such and such a person devolves on the universal church, the church of God. So, you know, this issue with... uh, Father Peake saying, well, you know, you're stumped there. There's no cardinals. There's going to be no pope. They're the only ones that can do it. Uh, that's not what the church teaches. And I'll give you a couple more quotes here. I'll give you the actual quote from this Cardinal Cajetan. By exception or by supplementary manner, this power, that is, of electing a pope, corresponds to the church and to the council. Either by the inexistence of cardinal electors or because they are doubtful or the election itself is uncertain, as it happens at the time of a schism. I'd like to throw out one thing to you, and that is, as we were speaking about, you know, by divine law, you know, it bars a heretic from being elected a pope. I'm thinking of this Cardinal Walter Kaspar. How many have ever heard of him? Raise your hand. He was, um, he's a part of this commission with regard to the relationship of the church, the Vatican II church, that is, to the Jews. And there was a statement made that really even bothered even the Protestants. And I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I like to throw these things out while they're in my mind. And uh, this is an article, uh, AP article, and it's talking about how the Baptists are in a fury against the Catholic Church because they're saying, and I'm going to give the the key passage to this statement. It's a joint statement between the Vatican II leaders and the Jews. A deepening Catholic appreciation of the eternal covenant between God and the Jewish people, together with a recognition of the divinely given mission to Jews to witness to God's faithful love, lead to the conclusion that campaigns that target Jews for conversion to Christianity are no longer theologically acceptable in the Catholic Church. Meaning, You cannot target the Jews for conversion. It's theologically unacceptable. Now, to take that another step further, what's also interesting, too, I mean, I don't want to spill everything here, otherwise it would be a mess. What's also interesting, too, is that John Paul II, when he visited the synagogue in Germany, 
he actually said that the the old covenant is still valid for the Jews. It's never been revoked by God. That is utterly, absolutely preposterous. And his father, or this Cardinal Walter Kaspar, he went to, on to clarify this issue of what he meant because there was controversy. People were upset that he would dare to say that Jews don't need to be, tar- or be you know, objects for conversion. And he said, this is in our diocesan paper in Omaha. Cardinal Walter Kaspar, head of the Vatican's Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews, addressed the issue in a Boston speech in November. He said Christians in their relations with the Jews should not hide or deny the missionary dimension of their faith, but recognize they should recognize that Jews need not be converted to Christianity to be saved. So, I mean, he's putting it right in a nutshell. They don't need to be targeted conversion. They don't need to be converted. And this is from the diocesan paper on the death of John Paul II, where he says, He who meets Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ meets Judaism. He describes the Jews as, quote, the people of God of the Old Covenant, never retracted by God. They don't, as far as John Paul II is concerned, as Father Walter Kaspar is concerned, Jews don't need to be converted. Their covenant, the Old Testament, is still valid. And that, my dear friends in Christ, is absolutely preposterous. So let's continue on with these quotes. We're kind of getting away from the topic here. We also have below the Ecclesia Christi, when it would be necessary to proceed with the election. If it is impossible to follow the regulations of papal law, as was the case during the Great Western Schism, one can accept without difficulty that the power of election could be transferred to a general council, because natural law prescribes that in such cases the power of a superior is passed to the immediate inferior, because this is absolutely necessary for the survival of the society and to avoid the tribulations of extreme need. Now, this has already been done during the Western Schism at the Council of Constance. Council of Constance, as with any true council, when the Pope dies, the council is suspended. They can't teach anything because their teaching authority is connected with the papacy. In the ecumenical council, the bishops have to be in union with the Pope. But what did the Council of Constance do? They determined because they were not sure who the true cardinals were, that they would get delegates from each country together with all the remaining cardinals. And each group, the delegates and the remaining doubtful cardinals would elect, have to elect the same person by a majority, and that was Pope Martin V. Victoria, even if St. Peter would not have determined anything once he was dead, I did that to keep everybody awake. (laughs) Even if St. Peter would not have determined anything once he was dead, the church had the power to substitute him and to appoint a successor to him. If by any calamity, war, or plague, all the cardinals would be lacking, we cannot doubt that the church could provide for herself a holy father. Hence, such an election, it should be carried out by the whole church, all the church and not by any particular church. And this is because that power is common and concerns the whole church. So it must be the duty of the whole church. Now my point in mentioning these things is not to start organizing a conclave. That would be absolutely ridiculous. But my point is is that such such objections like Father John Peake saying, well, how are you going to have? How can you explain perpetual successors? And how can there be another election if there's no cardinals? This has all been explained. It's all been taken care of. This doesn't does not present a problem. <clears throat> now I'd like to throw in here one other thing. This is Monsignor Charles Jurnay. He's talking about what is the state of the church during a time of interregnum during a vacancy. He says, We must not think that the church 
of the church when the Pope is dead is possessing the papal power in act in a state of diffusion so that she herself can delegate it to the next Pope in whom it will be recondensed and made definite. When the Pope dies, the church is widowed. And in respect of the visible universal jurisdiction, she is truly a cephalous, headless. But she is not a cephalous as are the schismatic church, nor like a body on the way of decomposition. Christ directs her from heaven. But though slowed down, the pulse of life has not left the church. She possesses the power of the papacy in potentia, in the sense that Christ, who willed her always to depend on a visible pastor, has given her power to designate the man to whom he he himself, he will himself commit the keys of the kingdom of heaven as once he committed them to Peter. <clears throat> and so when we think of this situation in the church today, the objections that are, that are being raised against the state of conscious position, they are not what I would consider sufficiently valid. One last point, and this is getting a little bit off the subject, but some might ask, well, what about the jurisdiction of the church? Where is the jurisdiction today? What's going on? How could this be? There has to be somebody up there, even if he's teaching heresy. We need somebody up there so that we can continue on the juridical structure. I found this in the uh, basement library at St. John's uh, University in, uh, outside of St. Cloud. And this was uh, Father Timothy Zapaneda. The Ecclesia Christi. We translated this. Now what Father Zappaneda was talking about is how authority comes from Christ to the Pope and from the Pope to the rest of the church. After having developed his thesis, he tries to raise objections. Well, what about the Western schism? What if there was no Pope? Where does your thesis go there? When there's no Pope, then how did they get jurisdiction? So to understand where he's coming from, what he's writing, he says, but upon granting or allowing our thesis, there follow serious problems for the time of the Western schism when three men were claiming to be Pope. Certainly a doubtful Pope is no Pope. However, during the whole time of the schism, the true Pope was doubtful. Therefore, there was none. Hence, he could not confer jurisdiction upon bishops. It would follow, therefore, that bishops confirmed by a doubtful Pope lack true jurisdiction. The same may be said about priests to receive jurisdiction in the internal form from these bishops. But nevertheless, the bishops gathered in the Council of Constance supposed that they had power to convoke a council and repair the schism. Now, Father Zepineta re responds, It would be permissible in the first place to turn back the argument upon our adversaries. The aforesaid difficulty presses them all in the same way as it does us. For all admit the bishops to exercise actual jurisdiction need either pontifical election or recognition. If a doubtful pope cannot confer jurisdiction, neither can he truly confirm a bishop who is chosen or consecrated. Therefore, let the response be direct. According to those things which have been said in Thesis 2a, the true pope was the Roman one, that is Urban VI and his successors. Therefore, he was able to give jurisdiction even to the bishops of the other obediences on the account of the common error of the faithful together with the colored title. Now there is a term under canon law, canon 209, saying the church will supply jurisdiction in doubt of law or of fact. Now this issue of color of title is no longer an issue at all. The church supplies jurisdiction whenever there's a doubt of law or of fact. But what this Zepineta is basically saying is that First of all, the other obediences, the group that's following the Pope or the anti-Pope in Avignon and the one in Pisa, those bishops and the priests under those bishops, they would have supplied jurisdiction from Urban the Sixth. Therefore, he was able to give jurisdiction even to the bishops of the obediences, even if the election of Martin V seems to be explained by the faculty given by the council by Gregory the Twelfth. For the rest, and this is the key point, if you figure those three popes to be null, let's say someone has the position, as there was the theologian Suarez who said, in his opinion, 
none of the men during the Western Schism were the Pope. He says, even if you figure those three popes to be null, you ought to admit that jurisdiction is supplied on account of the color of title, not indeed by the church, which lacks the supreme power, there's no pope, but by Christ himself who would confer jurisdiction on each of those anti-popes as far as was necessary. Now, understand the term anti-pope in this sense. If because there wasn't a sufficient amount of recognition on the part of the church to any individual man as the Pope, they were anti-popes. But we're not talking about heretics, we're not talking about Freemasons, we're not talking about apostates, we're not talking about schismatics. The situation back was those men professed the Catholic faith whole and entire. They were not heretics, it was a matter of politics. They weren't sure who the true Pope was. It was a matter of the politics and questioning who the true Pope was. So when he, refer, when he refers to the ter- title anti-Pope, saying even if the Pope, Christ himself would have supplied the jurisdiction to the church. Okay. I hope uh, we're, we've got a lot more to go, cover, but the reason why I wanted to put this on display is because I could read this to you and you could say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you can see this and for yourself, these are direct quotes right from these sources. One other thing I'd like to uh, to bring up, and that is with regard to something that uh, the Society of St. Pius X is very apt to, to mention. And they, they like to use this analogy, well, you know, the situation of the church today is like a, a, a father of a family. You might have a bad father. He might be an alcoholic. He might beat his wife and kids, but he's still the dad. So what do you do? You resist him, you disobey him when he tells you to do something wrong, but he's still your dad and you got to obey him. And they try to simplify the situation in that sense. The analogy, though, is erroneous. And why is it erroneous? It is erroneous because of the fact that we know that a bad father, no matter what happens, is still a father. He never loses that title, that position. He's always the father. You can't change that. And we also know that in the history of the church, there have been bad popes before. And we're going to cover this. We got the quotes. There have been bad popes and theologians like Cajetan and St. Robert Bellarmine say, if the pope gives you a sinful command, you disobey him. You can resist him to the face. But they're, what they're talking about is sin. They're not talking about they're not talking about matters of heresy, because these same theologians will say if he becomes a heretic, a public heretic, he loses his position. And it's the whole thing is the difference between impeccability, the Pope as a as a human being, he's not impeccable, he can commit sin, and infallibility. When the Pope legislates for the universal church, he is infallible. And we're going to take a little bit of time to study in detail what was the legislation that was heretical, that was erroneous, uh, that was universally promulgated by John Paul II. We're going to we're going to cover that. But this is the distinction. This idea of bad father, this is not a good analogy because the situation is completely different today. You have men that are spreading heretical ideas, and not just heretical ideas, but they're promulgating them into the code of canon law. And we also want to get into the infallibility of the church. Because some people will try to contradict and say, well, you know, Vatican II is only pastoral council. It wasn't trying to teach anything infallible. I have, a, I have a quote from Paul VI himself who says that Vatican, I, Vatican II was taught at least by the universal, supreme universal magisterium of the church. That is covered by infallibility. I wanted to show you a couple of quotes here, though. And uh, I'm not sure how we're doing on time here. This is from the uh, magazine 30 Days. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of 30 Days. How many of you have, have? Have you raised your hand, maybe? Oh, not too many. That's not too bad. Uh, 
This uh, feature article was on Archbishop Lefebvre after he did the consecrations. It's uh, July, August issue, 1988. I want to give you just a little foretaste of what the Archbishop says here. This is the interview. Interesting, though. Now, what do you see, you foresee, will be the future of the fraternity in its relations with the Church of Rome? Lefebvre, I hope that within a few years, four or five at most, Rome will end up coming to an agreement with us I am convinced that now we have more influence on Rome because we are keeping our organization intact. Strong and well-organized, and we are more valid discussion partners than if we had accepted the accord they proposed to us. What was that accord? Lefebvre was going to be given permission to consecrate a bishop with permission. Five minutes are left. Okay. It was a wave at me. Okay. This is the point here. And if this does not happen, Lefebvre, Rome would remain far from tra- the tradition. It would be the end of the church. Since I recognize in the Pope the successor of Peter, I am not one who considers the see of Peter vacant. I do not say that this Pope is a heretic, but his ideas are heretical. And they have already, they have already been condemned by previous pontiffs and they lead to heresy. To see how the authorities of the church have acted since the council, it seems the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit has taken a vacation. Now, what would you say if your child went out and broke some windows? And you say, you poor child, it was your arm that did it. You know, your arm was mischievous, but not you. His ideas are heretical, but he's not a heretic. I mean, that is very, uh, very confused, very confused theology. Another quote here. I'm going to try to get all this in five minutes. But it's interesting because Archbishop Lefebvre, I mean, he made some pretty strong statements in the beginning. This is when he was suspended in 1976. That conciliar church is a schismatic church because it breaks with the Catholic church that it has always been. It has new dogmas, its new priesthood, its new institutions, its new worship, all already condemned by the church and many of the document official and definitive. The church that affirms such errors is at once schismatic and heretical. This conciliar church, therefore, is not Catholic. To whatever extent Pope, bishops, priests, and faithful adhere to this new church, They separate themselves from the Catholic Church. But then again, Archbishop Lefebvre, he's good for this. He he zigzags. He'll say, uh, I am not one who considers the See of Peter vacant. I do not say this Pope is a heretic, but his ideas are heretical. They have already been condemned by previous pontiffs, and they lead to heresy. Very, very confusing. I also have the uh, article, long interview with this, Bishop Bernard PCA de Malare, and he makes it very clear Benedict XVI has taught heresy, but he's still the Pope. And that's what we'll, when we take our break, that's what we'll come back to, and it'll give me a little bit of time to organize these transparencies. I want to apologize for those of you in the back. I know it's not very easy for you to see everything, and you know I wasn't sure uh, how this projector was going to be able to take the pictures, because if you get far enough back, you can blow it up big enough or large enough. But what I want to do, this is my purpose, is to show you that in this talk, we have nothing to hide. I'll, I'll show you their arguments. I'll show it right out of the magazines. If you want to see me after the talk, and I'll show it to you. Some of the stuff I couldn't possibly, uh, you know, photocopy onto transparencies, everything. We have nothing to hide, though. These are the arguments and their arguments don't stand. But what we'll do when we continue in the second half of the talk after the break is we'll cover those theologians who say about resisting the Pope, and they're talking about sin. Because those same theologians will say, but if it's a matter of heresy, he loses the papacy. And that is something that happens automatically. He deposes himself. And besides those uh, other things that we have to cover, I'd also like to cover some very concrete issues 
with regard to black and white, this is what John Paul II taught, this would have been the 16th taught, and some things are new. Some things I don't think maybe, you've, maybe most of you haven't heard of some of these things pertaining to the matter for the Eucharist, pertaining to uh, the necessity or not of the necessity of having a consecration during Mass. Things that you know, any priest with even just a little bit of theology could tell you, you know, in his sleep, we're not Catholic. These men are proposing as, well, this is okay, that's okay, do this, do that. We'll show it to you in black and white. And like I say, I apologize, this is not the best of transparencies. We'll take a little break here. And uh, when does things start again? Two forty-five, fifteen 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 